Hello, today I'll be talking to you about social, psychological, and cultural factors with implications for disaster preparedness and rebuilding in the aftermath of the Nepal earthquake of April 25, 2015 and the associated aftershocks. My name is Courtney Welton Mitchell. I'm with the Universities of Denver and Colorado. And this presentation represents contributions from myself and my colleague Rubina Awale with Transcultural Psychosocial Organization Nepal. I'd like to point out before I get started that this is one in a series of the ERI briefing videos, and I encourage you to take a look at the others. This is an overview of what I'll be discussing today. I'll be going into these issues in brief, given the nature of this presentation, but I encourage you to look more into each issue if it's of interest to you. I'll be telling you briefly about the rapid assessment methods we used, disaster attribution, mental health and coping, social support, cohesion, and conflict, remittances, remuneration, and livelihoods, relief aid mechanisms, social political considerations, gender, caste, ethnicity, and language, and suggestions for future research. During the period of May 31st to June 8th, myself and Ravina conducted informal interviews with approximately 80 community members, government officials, and relief agency staff in Kathmandu, Lalitpur, Bhaktapur, Kavranpale Chok, and Sindhipal Chok districts. One of the first things we were interested in speaking to community members about was how they understood the earthquake. Specifically, what did they believe to be the cause of the earthquake? Many people shared with us that they felt that it had occurred because people had lost the path of religion or dharma. They felt that the gods are angry. And also they went on to describe that they felt that individuals, uh, business owners, and homeowners had not engaged in proper site selection or preparation with the priest prior to building in certain areas. They were performing a number of religious ceremonies such as Graha Shanti and Shama Puja. Shama Puja translates loosely to forgiveness ceremony, so asking the gods for forgiveness in the aftermath of the earthquake. For example, in one community we visited, 250 people had just engaged in the Shama Puja, and we saw this evidence across a variety of different ethnic and caste groups. People also explained to us that they felt fearful that another earthquake would, would occur or that they were vulnerable to other types of disasters. And they explained that this process of engaging in pujas was helping them to feel a bit better and to cope with the uncertainty and anxiety. Before I go on, I just want to explain that a puja is the act of showing reverence to a god, a spirit, or another aspect of the divine through invocations, prayers, songs, and rituals. So a quote from one community member after performing a puja, we were content, it helped, now we're less fearful of aftershock. Much has been written in the media about the traditional historical structures that came down in places like Kathmandu Durbar Square and Bhaktapur Durbar Square, but notably some structures are still standing. The Kumari Palace in Durbar Square still stands amongst the rubble. The Shiva Temple, known as Pashapudinath, actually still stands as well and has very minimal damage. Some community members explained that they felt that the Kumari or living goddess and Lord Shiva had protected these structures. However, people are also using scientific explanations to explain the earthquake alongside such culturally specific beliefs. For example, people are also receptive to disaster preparedness, understanding that there are things that they can do to mitigate risk. In the Nepali cultural context, there are a variety of stories that talk about the gods help those who help themselves, and these types of stories can reinforce the individual and community responsibility for preparedness. This is a quote I wanted to share from a woman we met in Bindunga municipality, um, or rather Bindunga is a village in Nagarjun municipality, and this is right on the outskirts of Kathmandu. This whole community is along the ridge line, and many of the residential structures have been decimated. People are building back there in temporary structures, primarily using corrugated tin that was distributed by one of the relief agencies. The army has recently come through and told the community that they should, instead of going back, they should actually evacuate because they're at high risk for landslides. One of the women we spoke to said, well, why should we leave? No matter where you go, if it's written in your fate to die, you will die. So I do think fatalism is a factor to be considered in the context of recovery and rebuilding in Nepal. 
Um, and this sort of adds to some of the complexity of, of the cultural issues that I just wanted to underscore with this presentation. I want to take a minute to talk about mental health and coping. Numerous agencies have conducted mental health assessments with similar findings. These are agencies such as International Medical Corps, Transcultural Psychosocial Organization. They point to ongoing stressors related to difficulty fulfilling basic needs, water, shelter, food. Of course, people are also anxious about livelihoods and lost livelihood opportunities and the potential cost of rebuilding. And there are social issues to consider. For example, some social networks have been ruptured in the aftermath of the earthquake with people displaced and having difficulty accessing traditional uh, social networks and, for example, temples, uh, schools, other community centers that would function as a form of uh, sharing and cohesion for communities. In some cases, these systems and structures have been disrupted. A lot of uh, the stressors that people are experiencing in the aftermath of the earthquake contributed to a variety of psychological symptoms that are being reported, including fear and anxiety, sadness, sadness, hopelessness, and uncertainty, anger and irritability, difficulty with sleep, concentration, and in some areas, such as Kathmandu District, increased rates of suicide have been reported. This is quite similar to what Ravina and I heard in talking to community members. Many people reported feelings of hopelessness, sadness, and depression influencing their motivation for harvesting and rebuilding. People reported worry or anxiety over disruptions in the harvest, lack of livelihood opportunities, and impact on children's future. A number of people we spoke to had been buried in the rubble and explained to us that they were having intrusive memories or flashbacks of seeing themselves buried in the rubble again and again. Many people we spoke to talked about the sensation that the ground was still moving underneath their feet. Of course, there have been a number of aftershocks and the ground has been moving, but even during periods where this is not happening, people said they have a very difficult time trusting their senses and knowing when the ground is actually moving because they're having a constant sensation of movement. Again, sleep difficulties, alcohol abuse, and interpersonal conflict and fear were common. Recently, there was a desk review of existing information with relevance to mental health and psychosocial response. And this desk review emphasized that it's really important in the context of Nepal to consider situating mental health issues within the cultural context. For example, many people might not explain or understand post-traumatic stress disorder or depression, but they'll describe that they have a wound to the heart, mind, or soul loss. And as part of this, they may engage the help of traditional healers and be less inclined to, um, to reach out to typical mental health and service and psychosocial support providers. People are engaging in a, in a variety of, of forms of coping in the aftermath of the earthquake. As I've mentioned, religious and spiritual practices are quite important. There are also child-friendly spaces that I'll talk about in a minute and efforts at reframing what has happened that appear to be contributing to effective coping efforts. For example, in this photo above, you see a local Hindu temple. And on the left, you see a private shrine of a Brahmin family. We observe people uh, regularly going to such places of worship and engaging in ongoing offerings or puja. When you see this photo, if you look to the left, the upper left, you'll see that this is an SOS children's village. This was actually uh, in the IDP camp where we stayed in Sindhupal Chok in Chitara, and the children there are essentially coming from the families that are displaced that are living in the camp, and they're engaged in games, educational initiatives, songs, dance, uh, things to help them sort of get back to a normal routine. And in the bottom photo, you'll see this is a tent that's functioning as a temporary school. The schools were, cl were closed in the aftermath of the earthquake, but then they did reopen about a month and a half after the earthquake. But of course, many were damaged, and therefore, the existing buildings were not viable. So these temporary learning facilities have played an important role in helping children get back to school and back to a sense of normality. A number of stakeholders whom we spoke with expressed concerns, however, that in some of these internally displaced camps, we're seeing the potential for increased sexual and physical abuse of children, and that um, traffickers are using these places for recruiting children, trafficking children to the brothels in India. This has historically been a problem in Nepal, but there are concerns that this is actually worsening in the aftermath of the earthquake. 
I mentioned this notion of reframing. Going back to the Bimdunga ZDC in Nagarjuna Municipality, again, almost all of the residential structures collapsed. There was only one injury, no fatalities, and the children that were together in one building survived because the walls of the building held. The adults were in the field uh, when the earthquake occurred. And this community, um, despite you know, such massive devastation of homes, really continually told myself and Rubina that they felt very, very lucky to have been spared and they had great gratitude for having been spared. Uh, the fact that the earthquake wasn't worse is something that we heard throughout our travels. People feel because it happened on a Saturday afternoon when the children were not in school, when people were not at their place of business, a lot of the collapsed structures uh, did not result in the deaths that, that would have occurred had it happened during the weekday. The New York Times and others have reported a great spirit of cooperation in Nepal among some communities, including communities that didn't receive timely relief aid for weeks. Uh, we certainly saw this ourselves. Uh, tentatively, I can say that we saw this more often in rural, ethnically homogenous communities. That's kind of a working hypothesis. You know, we didn't look at a random sample of communities, but uh, we did see quite striking examples of cooperation. In the photo on this slide, you can see community members clearing the rubble, and they're planning in turn to help each community member in this village and erect, erect a temporary shelter. This was right before the monsoon season, so people would have you know, some means of safe shelter when the rains uh, started up. These are images from a uh, squatter's settlement along the banks of the Bagamati River in Kathmandu. This is a settlement that has been there for years. They've experienced a number of hardships. The community was actually bulldozed by the government in 2012. 70% um, of them resettled in the same area for lack of options. This is a community that has very, very little. Despite this, they've actually been providing temporary shelter for earthquake victims and collected quite a substantial amount of money to donate to earthquake victims. There have been a number of relief efforts by local volunteer groups, religious communities, and local business leaders. This is just one example. On the outskirts of Kathmandu, there's a place called Camp Hope. This is an internally displaced camp for over 300 villagers from Sindhupalchok district, and it's run by local business leaders affiliated with a local hotel chain, Dwarika. Again, this is one of a myriad of examples like this where local community members, business leaders, have taken the initiative to help individuals, communities, you know, school supplies, food, uh, water, shelter, and are committed actually to the, the assistance going on for months, certainly through monsoon and helping people to build back. And many times uh, these, these types of sort of ad hoc camps and temporary facilities have sprung up in the absence of any support from the government or relief agents. However, I think it's important in painting a fuller picture of what's happening to note that we did hear about a number of conflicts in communities. Again, a sort of tentative working hypothesis is that this appeared to be the case more in semi-urban places, possibly more common among mixed ethnicity or caste groups. We heard about conflict over relief aid, jealous regarding distribution. Previous conflicts like water access and use becoming worse in the aftermath of the earthquake. Um, a number of temporary shelters have been erected on land that's traditionally farmed, and as it becomes clear that people are going to need to stay there for more than a few weeks, those landowners are increasingly that land so that they can use the land to farm, and some conflicts are erupting over this. I want to take a minute to talk about remittances, remuneration, and the implications of who will be left behind in the villages to rebuild in the long term. Nepal is highly dependent on remittances. Remittances are essentially the money that Nepalis working abroad send back to Nepal. It's common for young Nepali men to go abroad, particularly to countries throughout the Middle East, and work on construction projects and send this money home. Many people in the villages we visited said that they felt that Nepal would be more dependent than ever on young men going abroad and sending back money to help with the rebuilding effort. Now, the government of Nepal does have a provision to provide people some remuneration for lost loved ones and lost property. However, people express to us concerns about accessing those funds. 
feeling that um, the paperwork that's required is too cumbersome and therefore they don't feel that they'll ever see that money. In addition, the money is thought to be um, inadequate in many ways. So for example, a modest shelter uh, might cost 60,000 rupees to rebuild and the government um, standard compensation is 15,000. Agencies have been um, emphasizing that there will be people left behind to rebuild who may be somewhat ill-equipped for the rebuilding effort. So for example, here's a quote, burden of, uh, burden of rebuilding will be placed upon women, adolescents, the sick, and the elderly because many healthy young adult and middle-aged men are not in rural communities. Livelihood disruptions I think are important to consider. A number of people lost livestock. The harvest this year and planting season, season has been pushed back. Um, Nepal is highly dependent on tourism and has been hit hard in terms of the history of the Civil War having an impact on tourism and now this further impact of the earthquake is likely to make it very difficult for the country to regrow the tourism sector on which they're very dependent. There's a lack of available goods as well for small shop owners. Some of the factories are not functioning and producing the goods. However, the earthquake has provided opportunities for some in terms of um, numerous relief and recovery jobs with aid agencies and work clearing the rubble for unskilled day laborers. For example, the community I mentioned along the banks of the Bagmati, a number of individuals from that community have been working clearing the rubble and this is uh, unusual for them to have this kind of consistent paid work opportunity. In brief, I want to mention relief aid mechanisms. The humanitarian cluster system is active in Nepal. This is a coordination mechanism that has been introduced worldwide for humanitarian aid and relief and recovery efforts. Uh, it was introduced in 2005. It's basically a sector-specific approach to coordination and funding the field. For example, the shelter cluster is uh, supporting plans that the government of Nepal developed for long-term housing recovery. And this is uh, the shelter cluster is comprised of 30 agencies supporting the government of Nepal. And these agencies are, are, you know, there are some local agencies, there are some international agencies, but they all have disaster and reconstruction expertise. So hopefully this will enhance long-term recovery and rebuilding with these coordinated efforts locally and internationally in collaboration with the government of Nepal. Um, of course, despite some of the benefits of the humanitarian cluster system, we heard complaints that local politics are getting in the way of recovery. There's confusion over conflicting disaster response plans. The community members we spoke to said that they trust the aid agencies, but they're suspicious of the government and the local politicians. They feel that the politicians have been exploiting the situation for their own gain. In addition, it's important to note that there are remote area challenges. So for example, the World Food Program in trying to get food in has been heavily reliant on helicopters and a network of porters. And access issues are getting worse with the monitor. Discrimination in um, aid distribution has been reported. For example, you can see here an article highlighting uh, concerns expressed by human rights groups. Aid is typically distributed by local government officials representing higher caste groups and many of the communities with the greatest impact are actually not from those groups. I've alluded to the history of the Civil War in Nepal. I think it's important to understand that Nepal is still very much in the process of recovering from the Civil War, often known as the Maoist Insurgency. This took place from 96 to 2006. And Nepal has had no formal permanent constitution since 2006. The ongoing constitution discussion is quite contentious. And the recent earthquake could really further destabilize the country. Um, part of this will probably depend on how the government response is seen, whether or not um, the populace sees it as effective or not, and uh, whether or not a constitution can be put in place, not only quickly, but also um, in a manner that people feel is a, is a collaborative democratic process. As mentioned, Nepal is incredibly diverse with regard to ethnicity and language. 102 recognized ethnic groups, 123 languages, although Nepali is the national language. Many community members in remote areas don't actually speak or understand Nepali very well. And yet, um, local government officials and aid agencies are really quite dependent on Nepali as a language of choice in terms of relief aid distribution and coordinating rebuilding efforts. So in summary, disaster attributions need to be considered in preparedness and rebuilding. 
mental health must be addressed. Cohesive, homogenous communities may be more effective in rebuilding. Remittances and livelihood limitations are likely to influence recovery. Relief aid, including shelter materials, may benefit some groups more than others and may not be reaching the groups that need it most. There are numerous social political challenges with the history of the Civil War, the ongoing constitutional debate, the cultural and linguistic, linguistic diversity of Nepal resulting in communication barriers, and difficulty with access to remote areas. So over the long term, um, I think this presentation you know, poses more questions than it does provide answers, but I'd like us to consider how, how such social, psychological, and cultural factors might influence preparedness, recovery, and rebuilding. I think there's quite a lot of research to be done in this area. Um, I think it's unclear if communities will have the motivation and resources to build back better, or if they'll replicate ancestral homes using inadequate materials, if they'll add on to temporary shelters that have been hastily constructed for the monsoon season. I'd like to invite you all to visit the ERI Virtual Clearing uh, House website. And I'd like to thank my team collaborator, Melissa Tucker. She was a part of a group of three individuals that were helping uh, support literature review and who assisted with photos while I was working in the field. I'd like to thank a variety of other people, including Katie Wall and Amal Az Azizmova, who helped Melissa with the literature review. I'd like to thank the ERI Learning from Earthquakes program, INSET, the Natural Hazard Center at the University of Colorado, the ERI team members for discussion and intellectual stimulation, and I think very importantly, community members for being so welcoming and willing to take the time to speak with myself and Rubina and share experiences, as well as a thank you to staff from the following agencies who made time for interviews, Transcultural Psychosocial Organization Nepal, International Organization for Migration, International Federation of the Red Cross, World Food Program, Voices of Children, and the Ministry of Women, Children, and Social Welfare. Thank you very much for your time and attention to this presentation.